Good morning, I'm Sam Nichols from the University of Birmingham. Thank you very much for this invitation to talk at this very unique iteration of London Calling. I'd like to talk to you about some long read metagenomics that we've been doing. Uh, we're actually tasked with working on coronavirus at the moment, but we've still got some very interesting stuff to share. So if you're not sure what I'm talking about when I say metagenomics, we know that microbial communities are important. They change our health, our well-being, uh, they affect our development, they can modulate their own environment. So we're very interested in seeing uh, you know, what do the genomes in these communities look like? But it's impractical to actually culture all of the individual organisms in a community. And it's also very difficult to maintain an entire community stability uh, in, in the lab. So you can think of metagenomics as the study of genetic material recovered directly from an environmental sample. It's an untargeted attempt to capture the diversity that's present within a community of interest. And it's important to note that this is actually an ongoing branch of research with little best practice for long reads. So it's a very exciting time to be looking at this. And speaking of best practice, you might have seen this paper from us about a year ago. Uh, we sequenced the Zymobionics Microbial Community Standard, which is a mock community consisting of 10 organisms, three gram negatives, five gram positives, two fungi. Uh, this standard is available in two flavors, an even distribution and a log distribution. The even community has the bacteria in 12% abundance and the fungi in 2%. And the log distributed community has the organisms titered between 10 to the 2 and 10 to the 8 cells. And we sequenced both of these communities on both the Grolion and the Promethean. We made all of this data available free, open source for people to use and develop their own tools. And in that paper, we showed that we can produce a lot of long reads from a metagenome. Both the uh, both Promethean runs got about 150 gigabases and the Minion runs 20 gigabases. And more importantly, the reads were actually representative of the sample community. So we see that the sequence proportion actually met, matched the expected proportion in both the communities. So the N50s in that were quite short though. From bead beating alone, we were getting about five kilobases N50s. So it's easy to make long reads, but can we make them longer? And we can, can we do it in a way that actually yields uh, uh, better reads and maintains the composition of the underlying community? And Josh was actually speaking at London Calling a year ago about this. He introduced what we called the Three Peaks Challenge and what he'd been working on to, to achieve this. And now we have this sort of triple process that's able to maintain long reads for all the different classes of organisms within the community. So we want to apply this new long read extraction technique to all of our uh, complex samples and ideally hope to have single contact de novo assembly of genomes. And we think this will improve the power of taxonomic assignment, allow us to do phylogenetics on whole genomes, and perhaps even allow us to identify strain level variation as sort of metagenomic haplotyping. And I'm particularly interested in this because I'm attached to two clinical translational projects here in Birmingham. Firstly, we're evaluating uh, fecal transplants for ulcerative colitis. And we're also looking at the respiratory microbiome of patients in cystic fibrosis with, uh, in a collaboration with Liverpool. I want to talk just about the first of these. Uh, so if you don't know what a fecal transplant is, you effectively take a healthy donor stool and you, uh, you mix it up and you put it into the intestines of an unwell recipient patient. And the idea is that you disrupt the community and change it such that the, the patient is better able to fight off the infection that they have. Um, and we're very uniquely placed in Birmingham to do this. We have the Microbiome Treatment Center. It's one of the only uh, uh, MHRA licensed facilities that's allowed to prepare these samples, these, these transplants. And you can actually follow them on Twitter and you can see all of these transplants being sent all around the UK on the, um, the NHS donor blood banks. Uh, unfortunately, at the moment, like everything else, this sort of stuff has stopped until, we're, until we can be sure that these transplants aren't carrying the coronavirus. But we do know that these transplants work. But the problem is, from a genetic bioinformatic perspective, we don't actually know why. What changes in the community actually allow those, those transplants to be successful? And that's what our lab is interested in looking at. So we have a, a long read FMT pilot with one donor, two recipients, and we've taken a sample before and after the transplant. And on the left graph here, you can see that we're getting incredible yields out of these samples, stretching up to about 100, 125 gigabases on the Promethean and 20 to 30 on the Minion. And on the right-hand side, you can see the N50s as well, stretching from eight to 18 kilobases. And this is with Josh's new Three Peaks protocol. And luckily for me, someone has done an incredible job of writing an assembler that we can stuff all of these reads into in the name of Fly. And so on the left graph here, you can see on the Promethean and on uh, the Minion and Promethean joined runs, we can see that we're getting about 600 plus megabases out uh, of the assembler. And on the right, it, it, we can show that the contigs are actually good as well. It's not just all short stuff. So in reds, you can see that we've got for each sample about 1,000 uh, contigs between 100 and 500 kilobases. In the green, maybe about 100 that are between 500 kilobases and one megabyte. And in the blue, about 50 contigs per sample that are bigger than a megabase. So we have some really big assemblies, but they are still reflective of the underlying error rate of the reads. And this is part of the reason that these, uh, these long read assemblers are able to be so fast and efficient. So post-assembly polishing is therefore a critical step towards high quality genomes, but it's a cumbersome and costly uh, step in terms of computational time and resources. 
So naturally, as a bioinformatician, I've written my own pipeline. It's called Reticulatus. It's a pun based on the Latin name of the longest snake. It's a snake make based pipeline. And if you're not sure what that is, it's effectively just a workflow manager that lets you define a set of rules and things that will be run by the computer. We've built on top of SnakeMake to provide an easy way to just adjust different parameters, pick software versions, and set different strategies for assembly and polishing. And it's a simple process. We start with the base called reads from Guppy. We use the fly assembler, and then we do four rounds of rack on polishing, a round of long read Medaka polishing. And then if we've got short read data available as well, two rounds of pylon. So we were wondering, this is a lot of polishing, and how much time did we actually spend polishing for the data in our Giga Science paper from last year? On the gridiron, you can see that a rack on iteration was about two hours, and for design or even community, on the Promethean subsample to 25%, we were spending more than 12 hours on each rack on iteration. So this builds up. Can we do better? Can we speed it up? Well, what if graphics cards did something useful? So if you're not sure what I'm talking about here, uh, your computer has a CPU, a central processing unit, and a GPU, a graphics processing unit. And you can imagine your CPU as a bunch of really, really good dedicated postdocs that can do some really complicated tasks in a reasonable amount of time, but it's hard to keep them working on the same thing, hard to keep them working on the stuff that they're supposed to be working on. Whereas with a GPU, you can imagine it as a gigantic army of dumb babies that have just about worked out how to put a block through a hole. You've got many thousands of these dumb babies able to execute a very simple task. And this is actually very effective. And this might seem counterintuitive, but actually it's all about whether you compose your problem, your computational problem as a set of, you can break it down into a set of simple matrix manipulation tasks. And if you can do that and accelerate your program, we, uh, we call this GPU acceleration. Uh, and if you can't accelerate it on the GPU, then we call it not very good. So there's two or three parts of our pipeline that are GPU accelerated. Um, I'm not going to talk so much about the first one, uh, but basically the guppy base caller written by Nanopore is now GPU accelerated. It's, it's, a, it's a necessity because doing base calling on the CPU is now not possible. It's just too, too intensive. So over here on the right hand side, I'm more interested in the polishing process. So Racon is actually being GPU accelerated by Robert Baser at LBCB and with NVIDIA. And Medaka is being accelerated in-house by ONT themselves. So Reticulous is able to run these programs in a GPU accelerated fashion. So we're able to yield huge time savings. And on Racon, we can actually see that we can get on the Zymo Evo community on the gridiron down from about 100 minutes per iteration to about 10 minutes and a modest improvement for Medaka as well. It's a similar but less drastic story on the Promethean. We can actually cut about five hours out of the rack on iteration time for the larger Promethean community data set. But we can do better than this. So it's time for some real bioinformatics. I want to talk to you about file passing. So actually early benchmarks showed that they'd done such a good job of uh, accelerating rack on that the only thing that was left was file handling. And it turns out there's a little bug in Rackon's GZIP FastQ parser that no one had ever noticed. Uh, so if in doubt, just use something that Heng Lee wrote. So I ported his readFQ parser to Reticulatus and we were able to save about 40 minutes on a 15 gigabyte FastQ alone. And with a whole bunch of other, a uh, whole bunch of other tricks and some subsampling, we can get the, uh, the iteration time for Rackon down to about 10 minutes for that massive Promethean data set. And I just want to be clear that this is no diss on Rackon. We're just talking here about squeezing all of the performance we can to get these po this polishing to be as fast as possible. So you're probably thinking, what about some real data? Well, the FMT gridiron runs that we have previously would have taken most of a day to polish, now can be done in just a matter of hours. And for the Promethean runs that would take maybe a week to polish, we can do them in less than a day. So I think we can all pat ourselves on the back here and say we've done a great job. Uh, and this sort of brings me to my point that not every bioinformatician necessarily has to write a really, really cool, exciting algorithm, a new assembler, a new aligner. Somebody should stay and just actually write some really good pipelines. So back to the FMT transmissions. We can play uh, a little game of spot the difference. I've, I've uh, visualized the communities here from patient three before transplant on the left and patient three uh, week eight after the transplant on the right. And you can see that these little boxes uh, represent different, different genesis that have been uh, identified within those communities. And every circle is a contig that's been assigned to that genus. And on the left, I've highlighted this E. coli genome that completely disappears between before and after the transplant. And on the right, you can see that these sort of contig blooms of genuses that weren't actually, of, weren't actually seen before the transplant that are now appearing eight weeks after the transplant. Now, this is really interesting, but can we, can, we, can we go any deeper? We've got really long contigs, but do we know that they're good? So we got Josh to add in a spiking control of some unusual bacteria that we wouldn't expect to see in feces at less than 1% abundance. And not only can we identify them, but we can assemble them whole and they look exactly like the reference. So this is amazing. We can get this sort of, uh, you know, we, we can really start looking at uh, analyzing contact to contact overlaps for donor to patient transmissions. And this is what this graph is sort of naively showing. I've got the two bubble plots that you, that you saw in the last slide and every sort of black dot in the center is just a transmission, a putative transmission that we've seen between the before and after transplant. And we can look at these transmissions 
uh, this one, just a random one that we've picked out. And we can see that it looks exactly, the, the identity is really, really high. It looks exactly like it does in the donor than it does in the recipient. But the really interesting thing is if you look at this in BLAST, it doesn't look like anything we've seen before in the databases. There's only about 65% identity. So we're identifying completely novel taxa here. So I think that's really interesting, but you're probably not like, gonna let me go without talking a little bit about the error rate. So I just wanna say that a, a year ago, we were seeing on, the, on R94 that we could get straight out of the gate with Fly about Q20 genomes and with some good polishing, you could stretch up to Q30, Q35. There's been some incredible gains in poor research and development from ONT themselves. R10 just, just raised these scores massively and we can see that we're touching Q40, Q45 genomes. And if you follow us on Twitter, you can see at the beginning of this year, actually, we announced that our, we found our first Q50 genome using the R10.3 pore. So this combination of new pore developments and bioinformatics is allowing us to reach Q50 genomes. So to wrap up, long read metagenomics is a powerful tool for inspecting microbial communities. The ONT platforms offer an opportunity to generate lots and lots of long reads, but good license and extraction is critical for, to do proper long read metagenomics. Uh, we have a new pipeline called Reticulatus for GPU accelerated long read metagenomics, um, and implementing such a pipeline is actually time well spent. Uh, we've shown that we have evidence for transmissions from FMT donors to the recipients, and they include novel genomes, so it's really cool. Uh, and finally, long read assembly and polishing can yield Q50 genomes. So with that, I just want to leave you my acknowledgements and say thank you very much for listening to my very first virtual talk.